We are here this time at uh, in Montreal, here at the Fairmont Queen Elizabeth, stay, uh, hanging out with Stuart Chatwood from Tea Party. How's it going, brother? Excellent. Thanks Excellent. for hanging out with us again after the the group interview. My pleasure. Um, I wanted to I wanted to sort of go into the history of each one of you guys individually, yes. and um, like the the Tea Party has such uh, sort of like a vast expanse, and then each one of you guys went on to do all of your own things as well outside yeah. of the Tea Party. Um, talk to me about your very very early days. Like, how did music come into your life? In the Place. Actually, funny enough, Jeff and Jeff were talking about playing at the school assembly, and when I was eight, maybe I had dreams about that. <laughs> really? So I got uh, a Kmart guitar <laughs> with okay. the, the giant action that no one could play. You know, right. It's way too, you know, out of tune, etc. And I had a dream of performing, you know, back then. Um, that so early the, on, so eh? the guitar didn't work out then, but I, I moved to trumpet in school. And that taught me a bit of the rudiments of music. And after that, I kind of, music took maybe a back seat. You know, I was listening to a lot of music, that's for sure. But um, I met Jeff in grade nine and we did not get along that well. Like he was, uh, he had just played in the school band and he turned in uh, to a cool guy from a nerd. So first day of school, okay. nerd, uh, a month later, cause he's playing in the school band with all these older kids. And he uh, became this very cool guy. So. So we didn't, and we also liked the same girl. So we didn't get along that well. That'll but, kill uh, <laughs> it every time, yeah. But cut to grade 10, and we just looked at each other and just said, you know, we should be friends. And I just got back from Europe, and I would try and go to Europe every year with my family, and just had the cool new European clothes on and all the cool European music. And uh, so after a few weeks of friendship, he, he said to me, uh, just one day, you know, you should join my band. And I explained to him the story about the guitar. And, you know, I actually wanted to play guitar earlier, but it didn't work out. He said, well, don't worry. You know, we'll pick up where you left off and, you know, I'll teach you a few things and you can play rhythm guitar in the band. So you even at that point didn't really have much musical background at all? Uh, no, I mean, three, four years of trumpet. Right. And, you know. Just, but like, we're talking like school trumpet, not like. Yeah. Not, right. Not taking lessons or anything. Yeah. So I jumped in, you know, head first and, you know, joined his band that knew. They knew 30, 40 songs, so I quickly learned 10. <laughs> but I remember the first show uh, we played, and I only knew about 20 songs at that point. I had to turn my guitar down and order, you know, and then just air guitar. Because he didn't want me to leave the stage. And he's like, no, stay on stage. And I was like, oh, God, this is embarrassing. But uh, so I had a lot of learning experiences then. And the second and third gigs happened on the same day. This is a funny story I'll share with you. Okay. And uh, the third gig was at the... Freedom Festival uh, stage downtown in front of 3,000 people. That's your third gig? <laughs> the second gig, the same day, out in the county at a, a, a county festival. So we went that morning and we did sound check. And none of us had been on a big stage at that point with proper monitors. And the monitor engineer met us all and he said, all right, you 15, 14-year-olds, this is the way it's going to work. You're going to point to your instrument, point to the monitor, up or down. So we start playing. And everyone's yelling at him, turn my guitar up, turn my bass. <laughs> and he's like, stop, stop, stop. Okay, guys, point to your instrument, point to the monitor, up or down. We all start playing again. Turn my guitar, turn my bunk line. <laughs> so he's like, God damn it, stop you brats. You know, I'm not gonna tell you again. Last time, point your instrument. So after that, we all like pointed to the instrument, up or down, and finished our sound check, our first sound check, really, on a professional level. Learning the ropes the hard way. Then we headed out to the, con the county gig and that was like 35 songs, three sets. It was like way too many songs for me to learn at that point mm -hmm. in my novice years. So I had to air band for half of those, but it was a fun show. So the whole time you're pointing your instrument and pointing it down. <laughs> <laughs> I had control over that. Right. So we get back to the Freedom Festival and we're so excited. And we had changed the band name. and The guy introduced us as the wrong, the old band name. So we're like, ah, just rolled our eyes and just hopped on stage and we had agreed to get on stage and start right away so there's no radio silence and just bam, hit him with a song. And so we got up there and the drummer, Jeff Burroughs, just starts playing I'll Stop the World Not With You, Modern English. <laughs> Jeff Martin had his guitar on because they had obviously made eye contact. Let's go, you know. So the keyboard player at that time, he was fine. And I just got my guitar on and started, I just made it in time. But I looked over, Jeff's brother is playing bass and he's still opening his bass case. <laughs> <laughs> and this is time before tuners, so I'm like, oh, oh this man. thing's in tune still. But, uh, so I can't hear myself. So I go back to my amp and, okay, my amp's on. Okay, everything's good there. I look over to the monitor guy, I'm like, guitar, monitor, up. The 
guy's like, all right, this kid knows what he's doing. Right? <laughs> so I still can't hear anything. And, you know, I go over and, you know, nothing. So I punch an instrument, you know, come on, you turn it up, dude. So I have the attitude now, right? <laughs> like, do yeah. your job, man. Now I know what's up. So yeah. um, at this point, he's turned up three times and he's like shrug- shrugging his shoulders. So I go back and I look and I see my instrument cable on the ground. Yeah, I was in such a rush to put the guitar on. Right. I forgot to plug in. So I picked this thing up. And oh, blue, no. Blue sparks are popping <laughs> up this thing. Because the guy at the front has cranked it <laughs> <Yeah>. up, too. <laughs> Cocoon. I plugged it in, and all the speakers t- took a pop. <gasps> and then I started playing. And that song's a new wave song. And, right. You know, not too powerful. I came in like Pete Townsend up. <laughs> and you watch the sound wave ripple. It wasn't that large a crowd, but you my sound wave <laughs> ripple through the people and you know you can see the windows rattling on the front of the Riverside Drive there and the tempo of the song actually it slowed down <laughs> that's hilarious you can hear Jeff having what the fuck was that moment oh that's funny so, so that night uh, Dave with you, it was the keyboard player and he was a man of high honor and he just said to Jeff he said Jeff I can't play in the, the band with that guy doesn't know what he's doing, doesn't know all the songs yet, and it's either him or me. And at that time, I think Jeff was thinking about not having keyboards in a lot of songs. So unbeknownst to me, I was completely out right. of this conversation. But I think uh, Dave left the band that night. So sorry, Dave, if you're out there. <laughs> for, but the, I mean, <laughs> changing paths, but Dave is a great musician. So. It's, I think the part that fascinates me most about that is that it's almost like you were born like like you were born into it you know what yes. i mean you didn't have so like when i asked you guys when you guys were sitting down before and i said yeah. you know you had the the days when you were you know playing the bar gigs and i mean you had some of those yeah. as well but like you were really like day one it was get on stage and do what you got to do back then though you know when you like something you go oh, it's it doesn't matter right so you put the guitar on for six hours a day and you know you sometimes took it off when you went to the bathroom right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> And anyone that would listen in your family, hey, I got a new song. You want to hear it? <laughs> but it's just, it's interesting to me because, like, I know so many guys that, like you said, when you were eight, you had that, like, the dream that I, I want to be on stage. I know guys that are 40 and still had that dream that they want to be on stage. Too. And it's a great dream. And it's, it's fun. The reason we do this, it's called playing music. It's not called working music, right. right? But Jeff and Jeff, they didn't have a lot of lessons before they hopped on stage either, though. So really? we've always been uh, into the frying pan, into the fire, out of the frying pan, into the fire type pan, where it's like, just go for it. The best way to learn is job experience. <laughs> so, it, it's funny. And I mean, knowing now that like it, it came together so early for the two of them, like yeah. they were playing together when they were like 10, he said, yeah. um, then obviously there wasn't a lot of time for, for education and music to come up. But it's I didn't realize just how much you guys learned music like together. Yeah. I mean, that period from being age 13, 14, Oh my God. You learned every Led Zeppelin song, every Jimi Hendrix song. And if you didn't know it, you went to your friend's house, you knew it, and you traded rip, rip, uh, licks and rips off each other. So, uh, I mean, even Jeff and Jeff, who, who did start when they were nine and 10, they got so much better then. You know, like uh, when we lived at our apartment in Toronto where the Tea Party first came together, uh, we had a Marshall stack set up in this apartment. It was the top floor, luckily. We could open the windows and let the noise, you know, battle on to Toronto. But, you know, he would put on Led Zeppelin one. Okay. And then I would, at that time I was playing bass in the tea party and I wanted to play with my fingers. I was a guitarist prior and a singer prior, but six hours a day for six months playing the bass with your fingers. And then you just reach a plateau where it's like, okay, I can ride that bike for the rest of my life. I know what I'm doing now, which is a tremendous freedom, you know, because any riff, any time signature can get shouted out and you're like, okay, I got this, you know. And was it, was it a calculated effort for you guys? Well, we always knew we didn't want to be a covers band, you mm-hmm. know, and our heroes played original music. And actually, our heroes in particular produced their own music. So when we hit up EMI and all the labels, there were nine labels that came to see us all within a span of six weeks. And, you know, five were from America and four were Canadian. And everyone said, you've got to use an outside producer. We're not going to trust you with hundreds of thousands of dollars of recording budget because the records did cost that much. And, you know, when you think of a couple hundred thousand dollars for videos too, it was a big investment. So they had their points, but EMI Canada and I think BMG Canada at the time, they were the only ones willing to let us uh, do it our way. And EMI sent us off to Vermont in 1992, November. And they said, come back with three songs. And we came back with six. And the six songs blew everyone away. It's like, okay, go 
they'll finish that record. So you, I mean, I think you just partially answered the question I'm going to ask next, but maybe even before that, what do you think? Because you're, you're very, very young. You're mm -hmm. very, very fresh coming out of the gate. Yes. And almost right away, it seems like the record companies are paying attention to what you're doing. Um, like maybe they're not bringing you in and spending money on you right away, but they're, they're, they're showing up to, they're showing up to this thing. Actually in high school, we did have dreams because we would send demo tapes to labels around the world. And, uh, I'm friends with some of the people that turned us down, you know, yeah. from the Canadian industry and, uh, Chrysalis records in the UK rejected us. And then three years later we were signed to Chrysalis <laughs> and uh, you keep all these rejection letters as a joke at the time. And you never realize that you actually work with the people in the future that have turned you down. But I mean, half the time though, I would have turned us down too. Right. You know, you're not ready till you're ready. And, uh, so it's not even so much that they were paying attention to you is that you guys were just relentless about this from day one. We were, yeah, we had demo tapes sent out, but I mean, our little circle of sandwich secondary, you know, like I said, BFA, it was not only BFA, they were uh, a bunch of other punk rock bands. I mean, BFA were just the most notable one that did reggae music. So, in the same way that we did world music and rock, they just dug into Jimmy Cliff and everything and went for a, a pure, I mean, they hated Eddie Grant, you know, <laughs> they went for more pure reggae. I like Eddie Grant. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, we were in an environment where it is possible. And these are what all the other bands are doing. They're making demo tapes. They're making seven-inch singles. So, you know, we saw there was a path. And I remember there was a show on TV Ontario called Rock School, where it was trying to, it was out of Britain, I think. It was telling you how to be a rock musician and all right. that. And we were just like, oh, cool. <laughs> did you did you pay much attention to those kinds of things? Because, like, you, you said you, you had this dream about being on stage when you were coming up. But did you, did you pay attention to the entertainment industry? Um, only as it pertained to us. So the music industry mm -hmm. in, in particular. And I mean, we grew up in Detroit and we mentioned this often in interviews, how we are in a unique situation where we're exposed to not only British rock and roll, like British rock bands saw the American blues through their British eyes with their British sensibilities and brought that to America. And that was very appealing to our palate. But in Detroit, there was also the soup kitchen and the great, you know, uh, legacy of authentic blues. And Jeff Martin's father was an authentic blues man. He loved taking Jeff to the soup kitchen and just Albert King, BB King, and, you know, Three Kings. <laughs> and just those were his influences more so than the British rock bands. So but going back to being raised in Windsor, Detroit, there were four rock stations at one point. So right. come the age of 16, you knew every song by all those bands. Because uh, they would go deep into the albums too back in those days too. But uh, I, mean, I remember really being a 10 year old and singing Led Zeppelin songs, you know, whereas in Toronto or anywhere in Canada, you just didn't have that exposure. So people like to poo poo on Windsor, but it's a really unique situation there being, you know, right butted up against America and a significant American city and a significant American music city. So. I think Windsor gets a chip on its shoulder specifically because of that, but I actually think that that edge is what makes so many of the musicians in Windsor so, so good mm -hmm. um, is that just having that, that sort of like jadedness to it a little bit. Yeah. I, coming from, in, well, it, well, it's funny because I wasn't even going to go in this direction, but it looks like I'm going to. There's a Tea Party and Windsor have a weird connection, have, right. a, have a weird sort of like history, right? There's this, you, you guys are, you, you guys are like the big names that, that popped out of Windsor, you know, within the, in the last couple of decades and you have this connection to Windsor, but the, the music scene is sort of like disconnected from you guys a little bit. Like and, fun. and I mean, there's a little bit, you know, when people talk about, you know, the guys that made it, there's always that, you always know the people that have the little edge to them, but it seems different when it comes to the Tea Party in Windsor, when I hear the conversation, it's almost like Windsor doesn't even recognize its connection with you guys sometimes. And um, I wonder if you feel, if you guys feel that. We felt it's kind of changed. I mean, initially we were part of the scene there. Mm -hmm. Then we left and we lived in other cities, you know, since 19, I don't know, 90. Well, I mean, we were living in Toronto when the band formed, but we came back to Windsor for two years and we moved away in 94, 95. And we haven't been back since as residents other than Jeff Martin's, of course. And there was a lot of resentment and there was a lot of hatred and, you know, the posers, you know, and they want to be Led Zeppelin and Jim Morrison and all that. But I found actually across the coast in Canada, just it's too hard to continue to hate somebody for 30 years. Right. And the haters disappear and the people that like or, I mean, in the, uh, conversely, there's bands that I hated that I don't hate anymore. I admire them for sticking it out and 
you know, having walked a mile in their shoes, seeing what a career artist has gone through. But lately in Windsor, we've got such incredible support from the local radio station for the first time. It has started coming back yeah. around for you. So right? at some point, we pissed off somebody at 89X and they just did not want to touch us. And they were out to teach us a lesson. And we learned that lesson. <laughs> do, you, do you really think it was that? Oh, we, well, we just know, you know, we'd be number one, number one, number one, number one, not played, number one, number one. <laughs> and we just couldn't see the logic, you know, because we were there to support them in the long run. And now we get to do that because they are right. playing us now. And we absolutely love 89X and just they've done a great job. Yeah, it's not, I, I don't even want to go down this road as like a gotcha or as like anything like that. But it's just, <clears throat> it's interesting to me because, um, Number one, what you said is is now it does seem to have, have changed over. Like there's a lot of people that, that do seem to sort of take on the tea parties, like the hometown, the hometown heroes and that kind of thing. But I, I wonder because like I know the conversation that happens away from you guys, mm-hmm. um, or at least the, the ones that I hear. I'm sort of interested if you guys hear that side of it. Like other not than, as much. No? Yeah. 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 So just, I mean. So it's easy to not even. Yeah, I mean, you can't get bogged down about of it. Of course. You can't be in the studio thinking about what your hometown, you know. I mean, hopefully people, like I said, they'll see for how long, see us for how long we've been doing this, the persistence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we do speak positively of Windsor, you know. And everyone from Windsor has spoken of Windsor's ills and, you know, the cyclical nature of the economy there and all that. But, you know, like you said, it's made us tougher, more resilient, so, and more appreciative, you know. Sometimes yeah. people say it's great to live in Windsor because no matter what vacation you go on, you're going to enjoy it. Right. But I disagree. I mean, it's got great waterfront and all that, so I'm always, you know, trumpeting the benefits of the city. So. Your, uh, your, your, your travels through the tea party and through music and, and all of your other ventures have taken you all over the planet. Mm-hmm. How, does, how does home hold up in your mind? <clears throat> Actually, there's a strong ethnic community in Windsor, so right. <laughs> you are exposed to a lot of different cultures at an early age, and for food-wise, for sure. You know, we were in Turkey, and you know, it's just like going down, you know, why not? Or you know, right? And, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, also being a border city, you're used to, to crossing the border quite often. So, so you think it prepared you for all of that for the travel? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're raised somewhere in the prairies, then you probably have a much more limited viewpoint of the world so right. but i mean also unfairly maybe to the other guys i was born in england and i'd been okay. traveling you know my whole life and been to spain and france and all that before you know the band even formed so well actually that that is kind of where i was going to come around because you said early on that your parents would take you into europe europe really often as well mm-hmm. do, do you even like do you even sort of it, it doesn't seem to me like windsor holds a a place for you the way it does for like 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 the hometown thing right yeah, yeah. you seem to have sort of have like you, you seem like you're one of those people that really enjoys the fact that you're able to sort of branch off and find your own place yeah i mean i'm incredibly nostalgic you know and driving by the coach and horses and yeah. taking a picture and you know uh and you know just the friendships you know i mean everyone says it's the people in windsor right right so but uh being able to travel back to england and Scotland and all that during the punk days was incredibly beneficial, you know, as a young kid, you know, seeing people with, you know, piercings and the, the Mohawks, and, you know, many years before that crossed the Atlantic, mm-hmm. you know, certainly before it made it to the Midwest, but, uh, you know, it did expose you to a lot of music and having older brothers and sisters that were into that music too. And, you know, we shared that common bond over the music out of England, actually the new wave stuff, and the post-punk and the punk stuff as well. But uh, after, actually, that was probably a high school thing for us, sonically. And then we got back into the rock, what we discovered as younger kids, with a, a different appreciation, you know, perhaps for every single Jimi Hendrix song, you know. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you're 12, 13, it's like Foxy Lady, cool, you know, along the Watchtower, cool. But, you know, if six was nine, and Sandcastles, and, you know, Castles being sand, by the way, uh, you know, those are the songs that you gravitate maybe towards, uh, you know, when you're older. As as you were coming through, as you're developing musically, and I mean, I it, it's it's, I'm still sort of stuck on this idea. The the the, the fascinating part to me is because I really thought that at least one of the three of you had some sort of like, like massive sort of like musical, I don't know, thing that would push you in the direction of the world music because it was so unusual for the time, right? Yeah. And I mean, I realize it, it comes out as an extension from you know the '60s stuff, but. Like, I mean, I was around in the 80s and 90s and people were not talking about that stuff. And so I guess 
I guess where I'm kind of going with all of this is, is I'm really sort of, I want to know why it is that a, a group of kids who didn't really have a, a, a musical background other than just a love for what they wanted to do mm-hmm. ended up going into such a, um, an intellectual side of music because it's not like coming from a Western music background and then trying to incorporate Eastern music influences into that is that's not just a, Oh, well let's mess around and see what happens. Well, like you've seen that happen in pop music where it's just a surface right. level or someone's yeah. like, put a tablet sample inside the right. drum machine and just, you know, it's doing the same thing. And cause it's not that with you guys, you're not just simply sampling or adding it to it, but it, it, it like I was talking to, uh, I was talking to Darcy as we were driving up, as I'm listening to the music now, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a ton of theory behind it. But as I'm listening to it, I don't know, and this is as like a, a, a benefit. I don't know if if you guys are actually using multi uh, 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 using microtones in what you're doing, or if you're just sort of like mimicking them as in what you're playing. And I don't know if Burroughs is playing some polyrhythmic stuff, or if he's just really intricately playing some like simple for. It's just it's there's this interesting level of thoughtfulness, and I wonder where all of that comes from. I think. think- during that era, there was a rebirth of hippies too, like in the okay. late, late eighties, early nineties. And um, I mean, our, our heroes were, you know, Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin. He was interested in mysticism, so that takes you into different bookstores. And when you're in the different bookstores, you hear different music. You get exposed to Dad Can Dance, perhaps a combination of, uh, um, sorry, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the Lisa Perry. No, no. Don't quote me on the name, sorry. <laughs> Names escape me. <laughs> but they combined world music in a, a modern era. And, you know, she created her own, Lisa Gerard, sorry, Lisa Gerard and Brandon Perry. Uh, she created her own language to sing on top that sounded like world music, but she was mimicking. And she created that herself. And towards the within one of their records, we actually watched the DVD of their concert film before going in to record The Edges of Twilight. Prior to that, we didn't have a lot of money to buy instruments. So we would be interested in tunings via Jimmy Page's exposure to tunings. So we'd tune like sitars and have the resonant strings ringing. So a lot of it came by, came to us uh, uh, rather naively, innocently, but we found the power and we found the wealth in those uh, those styles of music. So this is Fatih Ali Khan's music. You might listen to a whole album and there'll be like six or seven little pieces of almost Western sounding music. It's really appealing to us. So we'll maybe, you know, learn that part on guitar and then expand on one of those ideas, you know. Um, it's not, you know, uh, plagiarism by any means, you know, it's just taking what we've known in our Western ears and listen to a brand new melody we've never heard and grafting that into something bigger that could be appealing to people. And hopefully some of our songs through our nine or 10 records, people have said, you know, oh, the bizarre never heard a rock riff like that it's so unique you know and uh, when we hear that back it's like okay mission accomplished and when we see the people that the fan, fans that might come up after the show it's like uh, they're telling us what they're listening to and so much of that is world music and people like peter gabriel running the real world record label out of bath england bringing people from africa and india and you know polynesia all to england to record in this state-of-the-art studio and giving them record, record contracts and exposure that they would never have before. That was very appealing. And he had a massive catalog of CDs that we were able to get access to and, you know, did the same thing, mine for ideas, for for points of inspiration for us. So. I saw recently there was a, uh, a video that you guys had done. Not re- You didn't do the video recently. I saw it recently. Um, where you were, I believe it was either just as Triptych was coming out um, and you sat down and it might've been like a much music thing or whatever. And you guys were sat down and you were sort of exploring the, the instruments that you were using on the, in, on, on the album that mm-hmm. were, that were Eastern Eastern instruments. And uh, it was actually, it was Nick Baluli that sent me the, the thing and Nick and I were, were, were talking about it. And one of the things that sort of hit me watching that sort of segment is if you guys did that segment today, mm-hmm. somebody, apparently me, would scream cultural appropriation. We got a bit of it back then. Did you? Yeah. Did you really? And, I mean, it's you're entitled to your own opinion. Mm-hmm. But if we took that attitude towards everything, we wouldn't be exposed to things. And someone's got to break through and break through that line and just say, okay, I'm bold enough to bring this foreign instrument 
bring it back to North America. Not going to play it particularly well, but you're going to see what it is. And then maybe some way, somehow, you'll be exposed to something and go search on your own who is the best player of this instrument, you know, whether it's the Sarad. And, and the funny thing, what happens over the years, you become better at these instruments. And, you know, <laughs> Jeff on Sarad, he's quite a good Sarad player, you know. And, uh, you know, we'd actually go to some of the schools in uh, California, Northern California. Uh, name escapes me again. But, uh, you know, that's where we pick up, you know, I think I got my fourth harmonium there. So I've been playing my way through many harmoniums in my life. And, you know, I've had Pakistani people come up and like, oh, you've got the fastest fingers on the harmonium because we're using it in a little different way than maybe right. a traditional northern Indian classical trio might use it, you know. But uh, it's 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 really amazing to me that you say you got some of the cultural appropriation stuff back then. It wasn't even like a part of the conversation at the time. Well, for some people, it wasn't grafted well enough. Right. You know? But there's that decision, oh, we could make something more authentic, appeal to less people and appeal to ourselves less. Mm-hmm. Or we could find that balance that we like and hopefully everyone else will like. And so is your pushback from like the traditionalists of those music? Yeah, I mean, because, you know, the Vogue Mad tour was happening at that time. And, you know, there might be some people that are playing those instruments saying, uh, hello, look at me. I've been doing right. this for 20 years and no one's uh, playing my video right now. And, you know, these lucky guys from Windsor, they just decide to do it. And, you know, and it came out of nowhere for a lot of people, too. They saw us. They wanted to put us just in, oh, these guys are from Windsor. They play blues rock. He sings like Jim Morrison and he sounds like that stuff. And when we came out the second record, I was like, whoa. And the same thing happened, actually, with Transmission, you know, when we started exploring electronics more. I mean, it just comes from exposure. I mean, Richie Houghton from our high school, one of the pioneers of techno, but quite often would hang out in the Berlin offices of EMI Records and, you know, be playing Kraftwerk or whatever, you know. <laughs> it, it just happened. Did you, know. did you guys come up with Richie? Uh, Rich, Rich and myself went to grade school. Oh, wow. And, we used okay. to play with computers together. It, it's really interesting because I hadn't realized about that connection. But one of the one of the things that really struck me is is when it, when I was talking to you before about going through your your catalog, yeah. um, listening to it with perspective now because none of these things would have would have stood out to me at the time. But you guys are. It's really interesting to me how you took what your your bass sound was and you explored like you could almost you could almost feel the decades move through your albums, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I sort of. I'm very interested in because you're playing with all of these ideas. Like yeah. you guys, you guys are very creative in that you're, you're grabbing what, like old school, old like old world styles, and then new modern sounds as they're coming out. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I, I'm sort of fascinated by that process. Like it's, it's, it's the highest level of art as far as I'm concerned. Like when you when you take the, these sort of disparate ideas and try to combine them in, in new ways, yeah. and it's. I don't know. It's just, it's fascinating to me that all of that group sort of came up together and then sort of turned music into it. Is It's not like Richie's a no-name. No. <laughs> and I'll come back to Richie in a second. Sure. But, uh, I mean, there was a nucleus of our sound and we could abandon that with every album and go to new nucleuses, but more nuclei. <laughs> but uh, we decided to maintain that. And that, in a way, in this world of no rules, gave us a little bit of a rule book. And Sometimes when you confine yourself a little bit, that's when the magic happens. Right. You know, if you go into a studio with every sample in the world, it's like, where do I start? It's like, okay, give me something written on one note or one string. And then, oh, okay. Then the magic starts to happen. Then you can expand on that. But there's purpose. It was purposeful that we did not forget our roots. And, you know, we do, you know, Transmission was their electronic record, but it still had blues influences. And Jeff sang like a blues man on some of the songs there, but there was things grafted on top of that that took it somewhere else. Um, you know, Robert Johnson meets Nine Inch Nails or Kraftwerk, you know, <laughs> right. a bit of those things happen. So as we go forward, we're aware of that. And the songs that we just wrote in the studio, I mean, we're always trying to get back to where we began at the rehearsal space above the coaching horses, where it was just like, you know, just pure high energy blues music. And then things were built on top of that. So, I mean, some days, you know, or some, some year we might just take a left turn and go and make a complete world music record, you know. You know, that's yet to be seen. How long have you guys been back together officially now? I think 2011, we, our agent called the three of us and said, we've got some offers for dates. Would you like to do something in 2012? And then we met up at a rehearsal space in Toronto on June 6th, let's say. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, Jeff Martin was, you know, 
sure that we were going to beat him up. <laughs> so he arrived with like three or four friends. <laughs> We've seen it ha actually happen with other bands. We just toured with Live and the singer at Live became estranged from the band and he had to bring his own drummer and own rhythm section. So, and when the band toured, there was like seven people on stage all of a sudden. But I mean, quickly, Jeff realized that we, you know, we mean no harm. We only love the guy. And mm -hmm. I mean, Jeff Burroughs and myself had several discussions. What should we do? Should we, you know, because we did want to break. Mm -hmm. and Jeff Martin was offended by that. And he probably said, let's split up, which we, you know, we were fine with because we wanted to break anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we realized that we couldn't really be a positive influence on him and affect each other, you know, by being apart. So we thought, you know, let's bury the hatchet and try and be better and be, be a positive influence on each other. So you guys, you guys get together 90? 89? Feb no, February 1990 was the first rehearsal in Toronto. Okay. We, uh, had this 13 hour rehearsal. All right. And prior to that, and the stick men were still around, but they were just fading as the tea party took off. And I think we actually like the New Yardbirds. Let's up the big of the New Yardbirds. Right. Where were the New Yardbirds prior? Uh, we had to do a couple of gigs that the Stickmen had committed to. So I think the first couple of gigs in Toronto were the new Stickmen. Gotcha. <laughs> before we had decided on the name of the Tea Party. But uh, I think the first official gig was like in June, the end of June in uh, 1990. So 90 until, and then when do you guys take the take the break? 2005 at the end of a cross-country tour with Def Leppard. Oh, really? <laughs> we're just like... Yeah, just burnt out? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like... What are we doing? We got to reset our lives here. What was it that was the burnout? Was it the was it the constant motion? There's a number of things. I mean, people were missing interviews and sleeping in and you right. know, having to catch flights because they missed the tour bus and just it was it was falling apart. Yeah, so. just life and the the drag. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, and taking things for granted, you know. Yeah, like when we got back together, that's the one thing that's changed really is you know other than the fact you can't really drink during the show because you forget things, but mm. uh, you're just so appreciative of the fan base. People Talk to me right. about the, the taking for granted part. Well, just like anything, when you do things day in, day out, you know, okay, here's another sold out show and oh, another video. And, you know, it's, we shot 26 music videos. So after a while, it becomes, you become, uh, you form a set of expectations of how things are going to happen. And they become the norm. And unfortunately, you should be excited see everything for what it is. I mean, it's truly magical, the fact that people want to listen to our music. So. Mm. so you go 15 years on a run, and then what was it, about seven years? How long off? Uh, I guess, I mean, probably six, six, six and a half six, years, maybe. Right? Yeah. And then now we're back. It's going, I'm oh, sorry, my math as, as we're rolling here is terrible, but we're, we're rolling almost next year, another next year. will be eight years. Eight, another eight years. Yeah. It, they're almost like, it, do you think about them as sections of your life? Yeah, I mean, in... There's, I mean, you could probably subdivide those even more too. There's the period when we were beginning, and then there's the successful periods, take for granted periods, <laughs> breakup period, don't take anything for granted period, and now we're in a creative period. I think. Yeah. We're, we're comfortable. Like uh, our plan now, I think, is to make an EP every year because it's a manageable amount of music people can consume and we can create. So it's about striking a balance, and we don't want to wait two years between releasing new music. It'd be nice just to hit people every year with, you know, six or seven new songs. Do you, do you piece your life? Like when you, when you sort of think about your life though, do you, do you sort of piece it that way? Like, do you separate it with the, with the time you were with the band, the time you weren't with the band, the time you were with the band, or do you sort of, do you break your life up differently in your head? Um, well, yeah, I mean, those are major milestone things that happened. I mean, when the band broke up, it was a pretty sad time. Too, yeah. You know? I mean, you can brush it off now, but you know, what was the what was the next year like for you? Um, for me, I landed on a. I mean, actually, the first thing that they wanted me to play bass in Smashing Pumpkins. If they couldn't find a girl, really, they weren't having any luck finding a girl. Wow! So I, I was on a, a plane to go to LA, but then they found their girl finally. But what, from what I've heard, he can be quite difficult to deal with. But everyone was like, "Well, he deals with Jeff Martin." It's no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, my friend from New York who uh, worked with us as our A and R guy at Atlantic Records. His name's Tim Summer, very famous uh, a &R guy for Sonny Hootie and the Blowfish. But prior to that, he was a, a VJ on VH1. Uh, he played bass in this band that uh, Michael Stipe produced. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name. I'll come back to that. <laughs> I have like a minute delay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Hugo Largo is the name of the band. Um, had two bass players. 
Oh, nice. No drummer. But uh, wow. prior to that, he was a, a music journalist for Trouser Press, and he was a DJ on MIU Radio with uh, Noise, the show, which all the influential musicians in New York in the early 80s listened to it, you know, from, you know, the agnostic front type people to Bad Brains, but also uh, three young guys called the Beastie Boys. And they would Never send him tapes it. all the time, and he actually booked their first official wow. gig. And they thanked Tim on a few records, and he actually sampled him. So, so Tim's got all these crazy stories about his different path through life. But he ended up in New Orleans uh, making an ambient record with this uh, great singer down there. And the record didn't go many places, but it went to a friend of his in New York who's this uh, very successful uh, psychologist, and she had triplets, and they were suffering from this sensory processing disorder. She felt the music lends itself in a therapeutic manner. So we set about raising awareness for this illness called SPD at the time, but it's since been renamed misophonia. And we thought, let's make a record and then we'll make a therapeutic record. The record was ambient music with folk songs. So This Land Is Your Land with successful famous singers. So This Land Is Your Land, we got to record Glenn Campbell. Wow. And that song's out now. The project's called Uncommon Folk, but we joke about Chinese democracy because it still hasn't been released in full. And we started in 2006, but, wow. but very special moments in that break though, where I got to record Mavis Staples and uh, Robin Sander, um, Jacob Dylan's on the record, uh, the Blind Boys of Alabama. So it's, Ooh. yeah, so it'll be quite an interesting thing when it sees life day, which should be within the next year. <laughs> they say, don't meet your heroes. And you've, you've had, an opportunity to meet a whole bunch of yours. Yeah. How has that experience been for you? Pretty good. You yeah. Know, I know Jeff, he'll elaborate on his portion, but he stayed with Jimmy at Tower House in London and just, you know, I think his uh, idea to replicate some of Jimmy Page's life got, the bond got stronger, you know, after meeting him. I mean, I think because we're musicians ourselves and we've had our own little level of success, when you meet someone with a larger level and so I'm like saying, oh, that guy's an a-hole or whatever. It's like, okay, well, maybe he is an a-hole that day, or maybe you approached him the wrong way. You know, we realize the complexities, and it's not all black and white. And then when you hear a guy's an a-hole from, like, 10 people in the industry, it's like, okay, maybe the guy's an a-hole. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think we have more empathy for the heroes. I mean, and I don't know. We've always seen them as regular people that have been thrust into the limelight and written iconic songs, of course. But, uh, I mean, perhaps we don't hold them in, uh, in the first place on such a high pedestal as you know, maybe some other people do. Right. Talk to me about the, the video game work, because that's that's super, like, just having read the list, like I said, I was a bit embarrassed, because you've worked on, like, every one of my favorite, the Prince of Persia series is, like, my favorite video game series ever. That was a magical period, and it still continues to stay, so it's oh, great. the bulk of my work in the studio is video game work. And, uh, the latest game is uh, Darkest Dungeon on the sequel to that now it's been a huge uh, indie hit and a critical hit too which is nice and you mentioned the prince of persia series which was also you know across the board pretty much a critical hit too and successful and so i've been lucky that manner to uh, to participate in this but it started in 1996 when we recorded uh, a world music record uh, or the we got really into the instruments an ep called alhambra and our engineer simon Prassi went on to work. ubisoft uh and he was the engineer on Alhambra, our world music record, and uh, he saw, you know, the influence of all these instruments, you know, and he was blown away by our, abil our ability to play them and mm -hmm. to craft such a, a sonic texture that when it came time to find a composer for Prince of Persia, he asked me if I wanted to score it, and I thought, great. So uh, I didn't get a call for a year, and then a year later he said, okay, we're ready to have you pitch. I'm like, pitch? What does this mean? Oh, yeah, you got to submit music and compete against 10 or 12 of the best composers in Hollywood. And I was like, uh, excuse me? <laughs> so I tried my best, and they loved my music, and the rest is history. So I went on and did six or seven of those. And you composed the music for the entire series? Uh, the first game by myself, and then I hooked up with Inon Sur, who's another famous composer, to do some of the more orchestrated stuff, because it's not my area of expertise doing arranging for 64-piece orchestras. And, you know, we have, you know, done that with the Tea Party on a tour, and we've been very fortunate to work with orchestras, but uh, 
I wouldn't want to take uh, the, the, the full uh, responsibility of that. So. Perfect. Well, obviously, I mean, I'd love to continue on with this, but we, sure. we have to get on with this. But it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You guys have right. such an incredible story. Thank you so much. Right. It's such a pleasure, brother. Thank you. you.